greatly honored to be here at International Academy of Biologic Dentistry and Medicine to share some time with you. I feel greatly privileged. I think the true, um, I, I, I haven't uh, met uh, John Trowbridge for a while, but I always look at him as an intellectual vagrant, and there are some of us, um, there are some of us who uh, have trouble staying focused on anything. It's not all that bad. Um, I, I learned many years ago that um, ADD, which I have a significant problem with, and you will soon discover, um, there are certain advantages of having ADD. For one thing, you always end up surprising yourself because you don't know what you're going to say. Okay? <laughs> Since you can't stay focused on what you have to say, so you are as much amused yourself uh, by what you're saying as others might be. Um, I want to take a few minutes, and this is very basic stuff, so I ask for your uh, indulgence. This is what I spend a few minutes with my patients. So I thought that before I offer some formal information, I might uh, tell you a little bit about um, uh, how our program works. I was certified in surgery uh, in London back in 1960s. And then I was a pathologist for 29 years. The only time I worry about diagnosis, you know, I realize that dentistry, a part of dentistry is structure oriented, is architectural. But then I think this group realizes that there's a whole lot more to the oral cavity than just looking at the alignment of teeth as crucial as it is. Um, so when I see a patient, and mostly of our patients are chronically ill, just like yours, I tell them up front that the only time I'm interested in diagnosis is if my patient has cancer. I'm a pathologist. I have very clear ideas of the need for absolutely precise diagnosis for cancer because in certain cancers it can be treated extremely well uh, without surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. And then there are other types of cancer where, in my judgment, and I'm just giving my point of view, um, withholding chemotherapy is a huge mistake. For example, uh, a young girl with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I, I think holding that chemotherapy is an awful mistake. Um, there are certain situations where surgery is a bad idea. There are certain situations where surgery, um, withholding surgery, again, in my judgment, is, is, uh, is bad. For example, if a woman has an early breast cancer, um, we all know that in pre-invasive uh, stage, it's almost 100%. That 30 years from now, she would say, oh, yeah, I did have breast cancer, and fortunately, it was caught early. That was the end of discussion. Um, even in stage one, you can have uh, almost 95, 98%. So there is clear, clear, clear value to having um, a precise diagnosis with all reasonable experienced pathologists can agree with. Now, the only other time that I focus on diagnosis is when I have to advise my patient whether they should have surgery or not. So my own personal perspective is that once my patient does not meet into these two categories, I have no interest in diagnosis. And that's the first thing I'll tell the patient. I have absolutely no interest in diagnosis. What we hope is that we'll earn your trust three months from now. You'll be feeling better enough so your body can communicate to you. I would rather your body talk to you than we talk to you. And I also hope that your understanding would be much, much deeper. And you will also have the courage to go beyond these diagnostic labels. Oh, John, uh, I had never told you I started writing poetry the last four or five months. It's always interesting when somebody starts writing poetry at age 69. Um, OK, so here's what I tell my patients, substitute for diagnostic diagnosis. A couple of analogies that I use, and I'm going to offer you those analogies, and then I'll try to flesh these ideas. 
One simple analogy is that you take two pounds of uh, grapes, you give one pound to a marathon runner, to, you take the other pound, put it in a pot, add some fermenting microbes. The marathon runner's metabolism will take roughly 30 units of ATP from one unit of grape sugar. That's the high efficiency human metabolism. And you will turn the grape sugar into clean water, clean carbon dioxide, clean um, ATP energy, and maybe small amounts of acids and the kidneys would clear it out. In the second pound of grapes, the fermenting microbes are going to turn, they're going to ferment the grape sugar and turn into a mixture of alcohol and acids. And the fermenter microbes will only take two units of energy and the remaining 28 will remain in that mixture uh, of acids and alcohols. So those are the two primary, essentially two large modes of metabolism, as we know. Of course, there are some intermediate stages, and I'll come to that because that's my life's work. How um, there can be a metabolic degradative shift from a high efficiency human ATP production to a fermentative mode with the devastating consequences. And then also in nature, there are certain fermentative microbes that can also go up. So we are degraded down and they can be, under certain experimental conditions, they can be upgraded. Cancer is a very good example. A cancer cell primarily is fermentative, but under certain conditions, it actually can learn how to survive in oxygen environment. It doesn't do very well, but it can. So that's the one analogy which is to help people that if they are tired and if their muscles are sore and if their brain fog and their heart palpitations or they have rhythm problems or they have so-called interstitial cystitis or in men um, prostatitis or um, call it whatever you want, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, polyarthritis, scleroda, it doesn't really matter to me. I used to teach immunology courses almost 45 years ago. So I'm comfortable with those terms, but there is, it's pointless. Focus on trying to separate this guy as polyarthritis, this as polymyalgia, this as sarcoidosis. It's really, from my standpoint, it's pointless. We are not interested in diagnosis. We are interested in detection. Detect what the problem is and address it, and that's our best chance. Now, the second analogy that I'm going to offer you is that um, <clears throat> just as a matter of understanding, I want to dismiss this business of genetics. So let me dismiss it outright. Um, one reason I think that um, good science is good science. So I do support wholeheartedly advances in genetics. But you know that there are no treatments right now based on gene therapies. And you also know that telling someone that you have a genetic problem is basically blaming the parents and after that there is nothing to be offered. So I would rather dismiss, dis, uh, you know, dispense with that. Interestingly, there are some people in um, Okinawa, you know that this is basic information and I, I realize that most of you uh, know all this, but um, I still want to create a little context for presenting the information that I'm going to present. So there is this place, Hanza Valley, north of Pakistan, what used to be Pakistan, uh, has disintegrated now. So those people, they live, used to live 110, 115, 125 sometimes, a large number of them. But when their grandchildren traveled to polluted plains of Pakistan looking for employment, within 10 years they have disease. And it doesn't matter whether it is asthma or heart disease um, or autoimmune problems. But the point is that their genes, which have been preserved for eons, it took just 10 years to disintegrate. And I also think that most of us are realizing that the epigenetics is infinitely more important than genetics. It is true that um, um, elephants don't, uh, cats don't deliver elephant babies or vice versa. I understand that. But the point is, epigenetics is where you can alter the script of life. Genetics is where you accept fixity. And there aren't too many advantages in accepting fixity in life. So might be, you might as well stay on epigenetics. The second analogy that I use for my patients is um, that every cell is expected to produce some metabolic waste and some debris. 
and that speaks for itself. But every cell also turns sugars into sticky sugars. We all know hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin, but in reality, uh, all proteins are vulnerable to sugarization in the body. So let's call them sticky sugars. We all know this is something that John Trowbridge taught, taught me many years ago, um, that free radicals, butter terms are answered. And so free radicals are going to turn all fats in the human body rancid. So there is then sticky sugar, there's rancid fats, there's metabolic waste, there's cellular debris. Add to it the fifth item, proteins. Proteins are threads. And you know that there's a primary structure, there's a secondary structure, there's a tertiary structure, there's a quaternary structure. And the functionality of protein depends upon the integrity of these structural you know, formations. And now there is a huge new burgeoning discipline called protein misfolding syndromes. Whenever we run short of common sense, we immediately come with a brilliant diagnostic label. <laughs> so, uh, and, and nature, as you know, that you have protein, and since structural and functional integrity of the protein depends upon these folding, that um, when there is stress, whatever, infections or whatever, some of these proteins get misfolded and there are chaperone proteins which will try to restore that structure. Original work of heat shock proteins many years ago. And then we also know that these chaperone proteins have their own chaperones. So nature has built layers and layers of restorative function as, as soon as there's a problem. So uh, I use the word pulp proteins, which means that the protein molecules get mangled. So let's put these five things together. Metabolic debris, waste, uh, pulp protein, sticky sugars, and rancid fat, and I call them grease. Just common word, grease. Now evolution, you would have thought, would have to create a system of detergents. You can't produce grease and not have a system of detergents. It just wouldn't work. And so it is that I plan to show you that unquestionably oxygen is the primary detergent of the human body. And then it has a second layer of detergents, hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide. It has more complex third layer of detergents that would be more complex free radicals, nitrogen-based, sulfur-based free radicals. And then you all know that there are these structures like proteasomes. So when the proteins are mangled beyond repair, nature has its own sense of economy. Up to a point, it will try to restore the structure. Beyond a point, it would rather re-waste that than try to keep wasting a lot of energy, trying to, something for oncologists to understand. So now we have this very simple model that to me, there is no disease no acquired disease. I could actually make a point for congenital diseases too, but just I want to sidestep that for a moment. There is no disease known to me where some cell population in the human body does not undergo that respiratory to fermentative shift, that degradative metabolic shift, so that you have major reduction in ATP generation and a fast buildup of acids and alcohols, which makes the cells dysfunctional. So all we actually have to have about 10 of these cells at the pacemaker of the heart, and you have a heart, a heart palpitation, or you will have atrial flutter. Or all what you have to do is perhaps 200 neurons in a critical part of the brain, which is involved with memory, and you will have memory deficit. I don't know how else to explain I, st I got interested in chronic fatigue about 25 years ago. Um, it was just a curiosity. I might say that there was a question in my mind when I started uh, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and I think that looking back, uh, I could have never really designed the course of my life. Um, but I did my surgical boards in England, I told you. I came to this country. I thought I'll just do two or three years of pathology because I wanted to go back. And I fell in love with surgical pathology, first the microscope, then the clinical pathology. 
and then the environmental medicine, and then the nutritional medicine, and then the medicine of self-regulation and uh, integration, and eventually the medicine of quackery. So that has been my, <laughs> that has been my course. Uh, I think quacks are amazing people. Um, we quacks are truly amazing people. And the difference between a quack and a regular doctor is, quacks haven't lost their ability to think independently yet. Okay, that is my definition of a quack. And so I feel um, very privileged to call myself a quack. So coming back to those two analogies, there is no disease known to me. See, I got interested, um, Nick, I got interested in this question earlier on. Where is the boundary between a state of health and absence of health? And I think this happened sometimes around 42, 45 years ago. And it seemed to me that this was what a wonderful question to spend your life with. If God gives you 40, 50 years to do something with it, I can't think of a better question. What is the boundary between a state of health and a state of absence of health? Before we go on to the diagnosis, you have Graves disease, you have lymphocytic thyroiditis, you have plasmacytic thyroiditis, you have Rydal thyroiditis, you have granulometer thyroiditis, De Kerwin's disease, you can go on and on, but the point is that when you ask a pathologist what's the cause, the answer is we don't know. And if the thyroid is overactive, give a few drugs. And if the thyroid is underactive, find some thyroid replacement. But the final line always is we don't know. So I got obsessed with this question um, of what is the boundary between state of health and state of absence of health. I'll tell you something interesting about human nature. <clears throat> I write columns um, in for Townsend, and the column is this oxygen homeostasis. So um, when you talk about kidney failure, when you talk about or reversing kidney failure, reversing coronary artery disease, um, when you talk about inflammation and asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, <coughs> um, it's not a stretch to relate everything that patient is experiencing down to oxygen homeostasis. That, that's, uh, or at least it didn't seem to me stretch because I've been working at it for a long time. But about a year and a half ago, I wanted to do a column on hormones. Now our observations was repeatedly, in fact, when I was doing work with chronic fatigue fibromyalgia, I wasn't even looking at the hormones. That was the furthest thing out of my mind. And then some women came back and there was one particular woman that I probably would remember forever. And she, she said, this is the darndest thing. I thought I had menopause at age 42. I was totally disabled. And uh, gradually, a year later, two years later, I'm, I started feeling better. And now I've waited for six months to come back and tell you that I've started my periods back again about a year ago. And now it's all regular. So I thought, OK, she went to a pseudomenopause. And that was the beginning of the term pseudomenopause for me. And we did, uh, we put together some data from our uh, center, and we published an outcome study of these young women who stopped having period. And they could be as young as 21, or they could be as old as, let's say, 45. But I knew at that time also, later on when I started looking at hormones, that there are these people you can trace Let's say you have a 54-year-old woman, and let's say her estradiol is 50. Now you, she goes through some extended stress. Somebody who comes to my mind, uh, she, she gave up her job, and she bought a bakery. And of course, it was an old bakery, a lot of dust, mold, this or that. And then the stress of starting a new business. So over a period of two years, it was very illuminating to me that her estradiol came, keep coming, kept coming down until it was almost four or five. And then I thought of, you know, I didn't see her for a year when she came, it was down to whatever, close to zero. So I said, you know, you need some hormones and I could give you that, but if you want to, I really would like to do something else. I would like to see if we rigidly follow our program in three months, what would happen to estradiol? And uh, because I had some sense about this, this was a very dramatic case, and it started climbing up, and it went back to where it was. And I said, aha, 
I didn't give her hormones. So my sense was that the hormonal systems cannot be immune to the larger revolutionary scheme of things. They have to be part of the same thing. And if I keep, kept restoring the adrenal function and the processing of hormones in the liver, we should be able to get that. So that was the paper that we published. Now here was my problem. When I wanted to write that paper, the data was very clear. I said this would be, even uh, for people who've been listening to me or reading my stuff, it would be a big stretch of imagination that somebody is saying, hey, focusing on oxygen and eustasis, you can restore their hormonal balance. I thought this would be a big stretch. <coughs> and it did give me some anxiety because I, uh, I, I had to link the two. And until that time, I hadn't figured out how to link um, just correcting the oxygen problem, which evolution would have taught us would correct the hormone problems. But it's one thing to speculate. It's another thing to bridge the gap. And I had to present that. And I remember um, I was so frustrated with the first paragraph that I put it aside. I came close to saying, let's not do this column. I, I, I don't know how to say it. Let's not do it. And then um, uh, out of frustration one day, um, there was this library, and there's this book, biochemistry book, Bain's chemistry. It's actually pretty good. So I'm just frustrated with myself. And I opened it. And it said what you already, what you were taught in uh, chemistry classes, that oxygenases insert oxygen into things to initiate these cascades of biochemical reactions. OK, that, that I knew. And then also it said, we all know hemoglobin carries oxygen, right? We say hemoglobin carries oxygen. Erythropoietin senses oxygen. So they, when there's a blood loss, erythropoietin in the protein, a protein in the kidney senses lack of oxygen. And so it produces a stimulus apogen we give injection. But that's nature's injection to have, have an outburst of uh, um, erythropoietin. And that would release red cells from the bone marrow. And you can go on and on. So I said, I had this eureka moment. And I said, what if I turn it around? Rather than say that oxygen is the substrate and everything else acts upon it, hemoglobin carries it, oxygenase enzymes insert it, erythropoietin senses it, hypoxia inducible factors is a huge family of um, proteins which are sensors for oxygen. And now you know that some frogs have this also in their skin. So the frogs can sense the ambient oxygen by these proteins located in their skin, and they can adapt to the changing oxygen conditions. So the, my eureka moment was, what if I said that oxygen is not substrate, oxygen is the driver? I said, that solves all my problems. Now I had to rewrite the paper saying, oxygen is not a substrate, oxygen is a driver, it's a, it's a modulator, it's a regulator. And at that time, um, uh, there were three analogies that I, I published in that paper. And one of them was this uh, for grease and detergent. That if you have too much grease on the cells, oxygen just can't get in. So it can drive your Krebs cycle chemistry. It can get the oxygen signals right. And then it also can't exert its differentiative uh, and uh, developmental signals. Um, and at that time, I was very much into oxygen signals. And then came this idea. And then I remember something that I went to med school 52 years ago. They said that the cause of insulin resistance is not known. So I just Googled Wikipedia. I said, let's see what they're saying. And of course, I was not surprised. 52 years later, if you Google, uh, if you do Wikipedia and insulin resistance, it will tell you we don't know the cause. My foot. It's the same grease on the cells which impacts the insulin receptor. You know, insulin is a small molecular hormone, 5800 Dalton or something. Insulin receptor is a massive protein, 355 or something, 355,000 Dalton. And it, is, it traverses the cell membrane. 
and there's an end protruding out and there's an end inward and insulin comes in just gently brushes it and it creates a sort of a crank crank shaft relationship insulin is a crank insulin receptor is a crank shaft so i remember that imagery when we were little children um, we used to have an old morris car and we used to spend half an hour trying to crank up start the engine and sometimes when it didn't then we had to walk for miles okay um, not a bad idea for physical health these things then this simple model that i'm presenting to you a grease and detergent the last three volumes of my textbook just came out 10 days ago um i chose to call the volume 10th 11th and 12th darwin and desox trilogy this is my tribute to charles darwin and i feel very privileged i sometimes see them walking in his footsteps which is you look at an enormous swath of information and you are obsessed with culling out some workable simplicity which allows you to deal with the maddening complexity of life because there is no one each one of you know there is no one in the whole world who is exactly like you i mean you you already know that i didn't tell you something that you don't know but what creates this uniqueness our social personal relationship uniqueness morphologic features our choices and of course that comes to your 100000 proteins and 30000 genes roughly speaking so the great advantage of um and i i wonder i the reason i um put darwin's name on those three books and i'm actually going to put darwin's name on another trilogy which is about diabetes it became too big so i cut it up into three parts and that's going to be also so i would have put darwin's name on six of my books that's my tribute to charles robert darwin but why the reason why darwin is quoted more often in biologic sciences than any other scientist to my knowledge is <coughs> because so little explains so much that's darwin's place and darwin's relation relative um, uh, is um, relevance to i think clinicians work whether whatever field we choose is that no part can be understood except to an understanding of its relationship to the whole that's integrated matter okay there's an article that if some of you want to read um it's a fascinating field i think it's one of the great untold stories um in the history of medicine if you just google in quotation write africa colon mother of medicine okay it will come up as the first when you have a, when you want something you know something interesting to read <clears throat> you want to kind of go outside your day to day problems this is a fascinating story i'm not going to go into this but i just thought that this idea of being open um to relationships and new ideas and trying to bring back we are not the first generation of people who are curious about nature or about our relationship or our place in that okay now i'm going to show you a couple of slides i did bring some slides and let's see how that goes this is a great great story <clears throat> and it has a great relevance to every single patient that we see again i'm just presenting in a very forthright way my own view of life so uh, i don't claim that um i have a monopoly on wisdom though i don't know why i shouldn't try um <laughs> the epic struggle of our time the epic planetary struggle in in our toxic preoccupation with daily intramural murders we keep talking about five people got blown in iraq and 10 people in pakistan so i'm saying that in our toxic <coughs> preoccupation with daily intramural murders we are missing the central story of our time an epic planetary struggle between the oxygen loving and oxygen shunning species and the incremental victories of the later that's really the single most important point 
of this presentation. The monumental tragedy of mass, mass extinction of species is playing out on the global stage. Oxygen-loving frogs and related amphibian species are being decimated by oxygen shunning fungi. Oxygen shunners are also responsible for the disappearing butterflies, collapsing bee colonies, and the death of bat with fungus-ridden noses that fly out of their caves in daylight and drop dead. <coughs> you know, one great model, the great strength of this model is that when 9-11 happened and Christy Whitman said, air is safe to breathe, I was driving to my office, I got so incensed that by the time I went there, I said, I got to do a book on this, except I was working on my textbook. So I took a vacation from writing for my textbook and in six weeks, I got this book out. I think you guys got a copy of that, 9-11, okay. The point of this was very simple. Human beings have a finite capacity to sustain insults and then they will break down. And it's not terribly critical where they break down. This is not critical, they break down in thyroid or adrenal or arteries, vasculitis or whatever. And so, when you expose a large population the stunning part of that is that I made my predictions very, very precisely. Every single one of them came true, except I thought they will build the monument, and I learned that I'm no judge of financial matters. <laughs> so I would never do that again. <laughs> but I did predict. You know, remember when frogs were disappearing and nature had an article, it's about climate and this, and it's about this and that, and I said in the final analysis it's going to be oxygen and it's going to be fungi or oxygen, these fermentative microbes. And of course now, it's a matter of record. Nature came and said the same thing. They said the same thing for uh, disappearing butterflies. They said the same thing about collapsing bee. And uh, the, uh, these bats, that was obvious because when the bats would drop dead, they had these white patches on their nose and everybody could see that was fungus. So there was no, there was no stretch of imagination there. Humans are fully engaged in this struggle and losing spreading epidemics of mystery maladies. We call them chronic fatigue, brain fog, fibromyalgia, polycystic ovary, gender devolution, memory deficit, and rising incidence of cancer. But regrettably, the prevailing medical model, which is new and non general medicine, um, is totally oblivious to the planetary man microbe conflicts. <clears throat> I think if we stand back and take a larger view of this, we really got some real problems. And those real problems are incremental chemicalization of human habitat, incremental hyperangerization of people, incremental global overpopulation, and throw in the climate. For those of you who don't read Townsend later, I published three, a series of three articles where I marshaled an enormous body of information to support my point of view that in the climatic chaos issues, oxygen has primacy over carbon. When this idea hit me one time, I picked up the phone and I called my associate, Professor Fahimi, he's a pathologist, and I said, Al, um, I just want to write something, and before I make a fool of myself, um, I don't remember ever in pathology literature finding anything about toxicity of carbon. Carbon is an amazingly inert substance. So much so that when you have these coal miners and they have black lungs, actually, pathologically, you will not see a fibroproliferative response triggered by uh, the carbon deposits. It's always the asbestos and the other junk which causes fibroproliferative responses and emphysema and other things. And in fact, when, when they used to inject carbon for lymphatic studies. Again, uh, pathology literature is on this very clear. Nobody has ever demonstrated that you can see carbon deposits causing inflammation, causing fibrosis, causing cancer. So I said to him, I said, Al, um, I can't think of anything, can you? And he thought about it, and uh, he likes to give me the answer the next day. So he called me and he said, you're right, you know, I've been thinking about this. I can't think of anything in the pathology literature which says Oxygen issues are issues of immediacy. 
carbon will create problem. That's not an issue. But there is something else I present to you. Every mechanism that of injury that I know of which could be related to carbon is mediated by oxygen. And almost none of the oxygen mediated cellular injury is mediated by carbon. So for those reasons, I think if you focus on oxygen, we can deliver results. And I don't, obviously we shouldn't ignore the carbon issues, they're very real. But I am saying we have immediacy of problem. We are ignoring the immediate things. And of course, my great interest in focus of oxygen is this is the only way we can counter and make a scientific argument for people at the new Enron Journal of Medicine. Okay, they, they think they have monopoly on science. OK, I told you, John, I've started writing poetry. That's the first piece that I ever wrote. Okay. I did a three-hour fun drive in New York Radio. And that evening, uh, my wife was away. So I started writing late evening. And next morning, I read that. And I said, what is this? So I thought I'll show it to you. Will I be well? I'm acidic, sour. I'm bitter, dour. I twist, I turn. I simmer, I burn. My meadows are hushed. My toad silence. My butterflies puerile. My bees sterile. That's missing there. Noses singed, eyes gated, livers polluted, cerebri coagulated, fumigated, pesticided, chemicalized, I am not well. Squashed here, scalding there, will I be well? Just war, unjust war. When is it just, just for whom? When is it unjust, unjust for whom? Surges of victors, morgues of victims. Men don't keel over as in Western flicks. They explode, flying bits. And oh yes, infants and children, things collateral, adjuncts of war. Hopes, rockets that vanish, despair, Humvees that linger. Your exploding cyberspace my imploding inner space. Fathers with seared blood, mothers with marred mitochondria, teenagers tired and brain fog. Little girls with precocious puberty. You know, there was a study, General of Pediatrics coming out of Chicago. 3% of three-year-old African-American girls have signs of precocious puberty. 3% of three-year-old. Almost 48% of seven-year-old. The white girls are a little behind them. But these, these racial differences are going to be effaced. Give another 20 years, and whatever racial differences that we see, because eventually the incremental cumulative chemicalization is going to take over. And these, in the past, racial differences, in my judgment, are going to be effaced. So that is uh, little girls with precocious puberty, little boys in muted hollows. That's reference to Asperger's autism. Once I was sweet mother, so liberated I sizzle with rage. I'm earth, mother of the sick, people, plants, animals. This last thing here, ethicsinmedicine.us, if you want to write, this is what I use these days for blogging. So you can go there, put in your website, your own email, and once or twice a week. I try to write short pieces, and um, you might want to do that. About the larger pieces that I talked about, the primacy of oxygen over carbon issues and climatic chaos, um, and uh, the respiratory to fermentative shift that I was talking about, there's almost 300 essays on the first site um, and then the second one is what I'm presently using. And our focus is on trying to bring some ethics into this, because I think without this idea, it's going to be difficult. So the evolution of oxygen model of disease, I'm going to go rapidly quickly. I think I made my points with those two analogies. And it's also most of stuff is in your handout. Uh, nature chose oxygen to drive human evolution. One time, a patient said to me, she said, Dr. Ali, no matter what I bring, uh, or what anybody on the radio brings. Um, you always talk about oxygen. I said, well, if nature had chosen silicon uh, to drive human evolution, 
uh, then we would be all computers. <laughs> and, and if nature had chosen um, carbon to drive evolution, then I would be talking about gasoline all the time. But my problem is nature chose oxygen, and I have no alternative except to talk about oxygen. Um, so I talk about the issues of oxygen homeostasis, um, and this is, you know, most of you uh, know them much more about this. The only point that I want to make is that the first category, which is canker sores and lichen and leukoplurgia, which eventually will go into um, precancerous changes and cancerous changes, or the so-called burning mouth syndrome. There is, a, there, is, there is a short article you might want to read on burning mouth syndrome on that ethics in medicine, okay? And that tells you, um, at least my view, um, my, my obsession now is that I feel I don't understand anything unless I can pass it through the prism of oxygen. And it's quite amazing. Sometimes I think it will take me quite some time, but the answer usually comes. And that's the great simplicity. So little explains so much in biology. That's the, that's the, that's the power of this simple thing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the larger picture and then we'll come back to this medicine and somebody has to tell me when I should shut up. Uh, trapping solar energy to split water to release oxygen by primordial life form was the defining event in biology. That's where it all started. It's, it's quite amazing that um, these people, whether they study the sulfur or when they look at the oxygen or they have now these other, they look at the other types of gases, organ. It's quite amazing to me the convergence of the evidence which supports that somewhere around a billion years ago, things really took off, okay? And they took off because in the, when based on this incomplete information that we have, that as the sun comes off, as the as earth comes off sun, and it's really a, a mass of superheated gases, Obviously, oxygen there was not in a form that could be used, life could not have evolved. So it had to be a long period of time before Earth would cool enough, it can allow things to, to happen. Yeah. And then this particular happened before the primordial life forms were living in a primordial soup of acids. And they were getting their energy from sulfur and from carbon and to some degree nitrogen. And when the oxygen started being released, oxygen is highly toxic substance. You know that. We used to give 100% oxygen to newborns and they would get blindness from retrolental fibroplasia. Fortunately, we don't do that anymore. Um, so the first volume of my textbook says nature's preoccupation with complementarity and contrariety. And what I was trying to say there was that no matter where I look, there's nothing good or bad. There's nothing more idiotic than a cardiologist saying, well, this is good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. I mean, it is, it is stunning to me uh, how we've lost our ability to think independently. Uh, John, one time we had um, seven doctors at lunchtime at our place. So I went there and sometimes I tried to tease them. And uh, I said, okay, how many molecular formulas are there in cholesterol, of cholesterol in your chemistry books or in medical books? They said, one. I said, yeah, that's good. How many three-dimensional molecular structures do you know of cholesterol? They said one. I said, that's great. So how do you decide if there's only one cholesterol with one molecular structure, one molecular size, one molecular three-dimensional, uh, one formula, one structure, how do you decide what is good or bad? Well, then they hem and haw, and of course, you know, you take a blood sample and you spin it, and there's something light which goes up, and there's something which, uh, so I asked one of them, I said, why does some cholesterol go down and you call it high density HDL and some of it floats up and you call it low density and now these idiots are subfractionating them. You know, now there are so many of them. These are the, uh, it, I think idiot may be a strong word, but I think it is well deserved. Um, so, <coughs> so now I ask them, when was the last time a professor in a medical school or a hospital conference actually talked about, are there more than one molecular formulas, more than one molecular structures, more than one molecular configuration? And none of them said yes. Well, now we say 
that if the same molecule sometimes floats up and sometimes sinks down, something has to happen to it. And what is that? That's, of course, a protein coat. So if the liver is healthy and you have appropriate protein count, then the cholesterol is well wrapped and it is heavy and it sinks down. And if the liver is not functioning and the protein packaging is not proper, then cholesterol is going to float up. Um, why wouldn't they talk about that? Because there are no drugs for it. You're down to holistic <laughs> medicine. You know, sometimes the question you can ask is that my, uh, my, our practice is entirely based on Krebs cycle and oxygen signaling and the detergent functions. That's, that's how we think, that's how we take care of patients. But somebody would say that, you know, you have seven medical schools, world-class institutions in New York. How is it that they don't do the Krebs cycle? It's not that they are idiots. Maybe close to it, but not. <laughs> okay. These, do you realize these are terms of endearment? I hope you do that. <laughs> no, but seriously, there, there, there's a serious thought behind all this, okay? And that serious thought is, if you were taught the Krebs cycle chemistry in the first year med school, which we all were in dental school and nursing school, if we were taught that there are substances which will break this flow of cycles, this conveyor belt of energy, rupture it, or throw a monkey wrench, we were taught all that, then why wouldn't they today want to simply take a urine sample, find out where the, map out the chemistry and see where these are the blockages, these are the defects, these are the mold toxins, and this is what we, this is our game plan. What could be more scientific, more rational? The only problem is that you have to be in an integrative model then. You can't go the old way. And that's why there is no professor at Columbia or Mount Sinai or Einstein that I know of um, who is doing this work and who will come and give a lecture and show his data and say, well, this is what we do, this is what we find, this is what our patients are telling us. History of oxygen on the planet Earth. So the first phase, little if any free oxygen in ambient air, second photosynthesis splitting of water and accumulation of free oxygen, ambient oxygen rises to about 37%. This is interesting. They take this ember from old trees and they analyze it and that's how they come to. Ambient oxygen drops to modern values of 21, but now comes the fourth stage, which is the dangerous stage. This is not about availability of oxygen. This is about ability to utilize oxygen. And that is the age of dysfunctional oxygen metabolism. And I abbreviate it as disox. Original word was disoxygenosis, and then I abbreviated to disox, and then for patient education, I just call it dysfunctional oxygen metabolism. But these are the four important points, that when you do have dysfunctional oxygen impairment, whether it is caused by the grease on the cells or it is caused by disruption of your Krebs chemistry or glycolytic pathways, whatever it is, um, it would be impaired oxygen-driven ATP generation, imp impeded oxygen signaling, uh, depleted detergent function of oxygen, diminished oxygen-governed detox pathways. So, so those are the four major categories that this happens. Now, as far as I'm concerned, my work, except when I have a patient with cancer or question of surgery, is really oxygen therapeutics which could be direct, direct oxygen therapy, or it could be indirect. When you focus on bowel and liver, for example, to restore oxygen system, that would be an example of indirect efforts to restore oxygen homeostasis. And of course, ozone, hydrogen peroxide therapies, those are direct. So the fields of inquiry are aging, spontaneity of oxidation, oxidative coagulopathy. That's a term that I introduced um, many years ago. There was a big paper I wrote back in 1997. And the point of that was that this comes from also uh, Dr. Bradford was very helpful to me um, in clarifying these things. Uh, you will tell me when I have to break? OK. So there were many people who are doing this. And it, I was looking for a simple word. So if you look at with a high phase uh, microscope, the plasma is congealed, the red cells, you've seen all that. The red cells are all clumped together and, and there are plaque formations. And uh, 
So it seems obvious to me that coronary artery disease is a problem of circulating blood, plaque formation in the blood. If you have uh, a water filter, a water pump which pumps clean water, it works well for a long time. If you have a air pump which pumps air for a long time, it functions well. So if blood is, if heart is a blood pump and if it's pumping clean blood, it'll do very well. I mean, it's, it's so simple. No, it is, really. Okay. So if you can see these plaques, then the answer is that the focus shifts away from this nonsense of cholesterol. Sometimes I wish. The other day, I had this wish. I thought I saw Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to you when you write too much. So, <laughs> so the Santa Claus said, what do you want? Blanche, I said, Santa, could you give us a national amnesia and we forget the word cholesterol? <laughs> and then can you give us two more words that we remember? Insulin? And what else? Creatinine. Because the massive problems of our society and we can be monitored. I'll make a statement. I won't have the time to come to this. And later on, I'm going to do a blog on it. Because I, and one advantage, the only advantage of having a large center is that you have a huge flow of patients. And when a thought comes to your mind, you can quickly figure it out in, you know, in some weeks or months. Um, my statement that I'm just going to leave that behind for you. And um, is in my, at this stage for me, I consider it unethical to do a fasting blood sugar and then tell a patient everything is okay. Because in the last three months, we've diagnosed more than 25 patients where fasting blood sugar is 85, 89, whatever it is. And when you do the four hour insulin, it's the insulin we are after. It's not the glucose. The changes of glucose are derivative events. And I'm telling you, those of you who are more than 15 pounds in excess of weight, get your four hour insulin done. That's where the answers are. The answers are not in blood sugar. That's a different subject, but an important subject. And you can go, I'll try to do that blog. But also, if you go on our website, oh, on ethics and medicine, there's actually an article which talks about insulin depletion, insulin waste, and insulin toxicity. OK? And, uh, the only way you can understand all these three things is, again, go back to the grease model. The cell membranes are covered over with grease. Insulin receptor is impacted. Insulin can't work. It pancreas keeps producing more and more insulin. Insulin is a potent next to oxygen. Insulin is probably the single most important Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the body. So now what you're doing is you're pouring tons of insulin. Inflammation. Insulin in excess is pro-inflammatory, pro-heart disease, pro stroke pro-autoimmune problems, pro-degenerative disease, pro-accelerated aging. In fact, insulin excess is pro-everything evil. And so I, and the creatinine, why? Because I've been keeping some very close tabs on these things because of uh, the writings that we do. Um, I have yet to see a patient who came to me because they told him that you will need dialysis next year. When I asked them, when was the first time your doctor told you your creatinine is rising? You know, if your creatinine value is one, and if you take one kidney out, creatinine doesn't change. That means that if you lose 50% of kidney function, creatinine doesn't rise. So when it goes, let's say, from one to 1.5 to two, you've already lost about 80% of the kidney function, eminently reversible at this stage. But why wouldn't they talk about this? Because in their model, there's no answer for this. Even though New England Journal of Medicine published a paper, I think five years ago, LIU was the first author out of Taiwan. What they showed was that the creatinine came down, but they were very clever. They gave them EDT chelation because of lead, and they say, oh, by the way, we found out that creatinine was coming down. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe nephrology will change, but of course. I was, no. So, we come to then um, a respiratory fermentative shift in ATP generation, disoxygenosis, insulin toxicity, oxygenotic therapies. Those are the main points I thought. Um, demystifying disease by focus on cellular bioenergetics. I'm going to quickly go over these uh, uh, slides. I'll just let you read yourself. <coughs> the 
this is the first study which turned me on. The originally, I got turned on to this because of that simple question, which is, where is the boundary between a state of health and an absence of health? That, hap as I told you, happened to me as a young pathologist about four years ago. And then the next major uh, advance to me in my thinking was that there is no, there's no rationale nor any clinical benefit of blindly sticking to the diagnostic labels in immunology textbooks. That was the big thing. And of course, at that time, I was also traveling with many other quacks who were looking at the food allergy reactions and you know all the other things. So after the microscope, they took my microscope away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all three of us, we are university pathologists. Dr. Faimi is professor of pathology at Mount Sinai. I was at Columbia. Dr. Juko was also uh, in a medical school. And uh, between three of us, we have something like 106 years of pathology work with microscope. And we were all laboratory directors. We were professors. But I can't use it in my office because state came in. And uh, they said, you don't have positive and negative controls. I said, you idiot. When I look at a prostate biopsy, I don't have a positive control. It's peer review. <laughs> the applicable standard is peer review. What I call breast cancer is what other people should call breast cancer. What I say prostate biopsy is negative, other people should say negative. You don't have a negative and positive control. Um, but, and I said, if you apply this standard, nobody can practice pathology in New York or New Jersey. But then they told me, there was a PhD. The seven people came to my office, two from FDA, two from New Jersey State, two from New York, and one from seventh. I don't know what he was doing. And <laughs> like a fool, I said, OK, this is a continuing medical education seminar. I got these seven PhDs, and I got a lifetime opportunity of helping them really understand what we are doing. So one of them took me, and he said, Dr. Ali, straight out of Godfather. He said, <laughs> seriously, I'm telling you exactly what happened. He said, I've read your paper. I'm a PhD. And I tell you that I completely agree with you. I will also tell you that if you fight us on microscope, we already know you will win. But we'll make your life so miserable. And so I said, OK, I'll get my message. I, I still need my two legs. So then <laughs> out of that frustration, John, came something very important. After a few days, I was driving, and I said, OK, I can't use microscope. It's a devastating blow to a pathologist when you say you cannot use a microscope, OK? I mean, emotionally, psychologically, every which way. And uh, those of you who do that microscopy, you know, it's the single best educational tool there is. There, there's nothing which comes close to it. Um, and out of that sense of despair, uh, one time I was driving again, and the idea came, well, listen, you've been using focusing on microscope. You published all these pictures, um, and they can always say, well, you know, you're fudging it, you're, you're this or that. But what if I, there was a way that I tried to get biochemical data from laboratory other than our own? And then second flash was focus on Krebs cycle. So this it was a great, really, moment of insight for me. One weekend, uh, I, I think whatever it comes to, this. Uh, it comes to around 260 patients, something like that, 260. So one weekend, I had these 263. And I'm just, um, you know, I asked the staff to sort out who has citric acid, who has uh, akinetic, who has succinic, who has rheumatic, et cetera. So as I'm looking at this data, that was a eureka moment. Because look at this here. Except for this outlier, no, I have to go back. OK. Except for this outlier, citric is on the top. You had 196 people who had elevated levels, then aconitic 26, then succinic 40, and fumaric 1. And by the time we go to xyloacetic acid, it is 0. Now, then I imagined in my mind this picture, that there are seven dams, or you can say ponds, and the beavers come and they dam them up. And since the top drains into the second one, and this drains into this, and this drains into this, and this drains into this, if the water evaporation was going to go on, I have to redraw this picture, this pond would become much bigger, a smaller, 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 smaller. So now if you go back to the Krebs cycle, that's what's happening. The importance of this data was something, yes. The importance of this to me was, Something is happening at a global level. We cannot talk about thiamine 
we cannot talk about this blocker or that wise and co mineral cofactor or we cannot talk about this vitamin. Something is happening. These were people with chronic fatigue fibromyalgia. And that's where the idea of disox came from, that there is something fundamentally wrong. And we now have to find out what are the causes of causing this fundamental rupture of human energetics. And of course, if you take a thousand people, they will have thousand different patterns. But the three things that I found out, which stand out are mold toxins and toxic metals and stress. You show me 100 patients with multiple sclerosis, and within 20 minutes, I will tell you that if you focus on the six to 12 months before the diagnosis, that was the combination. Exposure to mold, extreme stress, and exposure to mold very often comes from water damage in the house. It not only comes from the mold, it also comes from the water damage. And some of the most intractable cases that we had, eventual resolution was, and this is a very expensive proposition, you have to take the entire outsiding out, and you see it's all dark black and blue with mold. And some of those patients who were well off, they really had to leave the house. That was the only way. And then they literally breathe that you know, air out. They literally have to dissolve. This dissolution of the grease that I was talking about, it takes really quite some time. Okay, let's move on. So now, this is a simple way of summarizing 